I do a meniscal transplant now and it's an isolated meniscal transplant and that's all I'm doing inside a knee, actually I'm relatively relaxed about it. Um, the cases that really stress me out are where I'm doing, for example, and I've done it, meniscal transplant with a cartilage graft, with an ACL or a revision ACL with an osteotomy. Um, if it's just a meniscal transplant, the quickest I can do it is just over, just over two hours. Everybody knows this, right? If you've got an intact meniscus, you've got low uh, peak pressures. And if you've got no meniscus, you've got a small sur contact surface area with high peak pressures. Okay, that's obvious. Now, if you lose a meniscus, this is probably the best paper in terms of quoting. If you want a paper to quote, it's Roos and Roos, um, Dermal Rheumatology, <coughs> relative risk of 14, 21 years after total meniscectomy. Okay. The easiest way to say is, if you lose your meniscus, then 20 years later, you're roughly 15 times more likely to have arthritis. Okay. Um, and if the patient still doesn't take that seriously, then you say the risk goes up by 1,500%. So the answer is repair them. Right? If you can possibly repair a meniscus, if it looks appropriate, you should. Now, I don't want this meeting to be constantly like whining and negative, but there are senior knee surgeons of our, your colleagues of ours out there who don't do meniscal repair. We've got a knee surgeon who doesn't do meniscal repair. That's good. <coughs> Very difficult to know what percentage are repairable, right? Because I spent ages trying to trying to work out a good number, just trying to get this from the literature, and I think the appropriate number from the literature is about 15%. Um, you can't, this, it doesn't seem to be there. And I've read you know, stupid numbers of papers about this. And then the success rate, well, varies enormously depending on what paper, anything from 50% up to 90%. Um, I reviewed, we've got our clinical nurse specialist <coughs> to review my meniscal repairs. Um, I repair 33%. Now that's skewed, right? So that's, that's double, <coughs> more than double, what the literature suggests might be appropriate. But then that's because I've got a different patient cohort. Our, our practice is in the middle of the city of London. Our average patient is a city banker. Our average age is, is 40 or under, um, and most of the stuff, stuff is sports injuries. So um, you know, it's a slightly it's a skewed patient cohort that I'm seeing. That's one thing. Second thing is that I'm an enthusiast. So if you're really into something, and, and then the more of it you do, the more you know, the lower your threshold becomes. If you find meniscal repair, I don't, I don't think any meniscal repair is you can say easy. But if you find it relatively straightforward, if you find it difficult, you're going to have a very high threshold, and your numbers will be low. And then success rate depends on the, on what you call success. So um, pretty good. I mean, pretty good. But the thing to emphasize there is not the kind of 80 or 90% are happy, it's that you know, at least 10% are not. So um, the way I explain it to the patients is that I won't know what I'm going to do until I get in there. I'm going to inspect the meniscus, probe the meniscus, and then it's a judgment call. You What's the equivalent with a meniscectomy? Success rate in terms of well, defined success. Are you happy? Short-term success. Yes, yeah, close to 100 percent. So, so, so similar. Yeah, but this is why it's so important that people like us are guiding our patients and not non knee surgeons or non soft tissue knee surgeons. The, the point I'm getting at: what stage those two lines diverge, in your opinion? I don't think five years is, is long enough. Mm. I mean, what we really want to know is what's happening in 10 to 20 years time. There's some case studies out there that are being published of young, active, you know, young athletic people who've had a total lateral, lateral meniscectomy who've developed fully blown lateral OA within 18 months. So if you've got a young person, you whip out their lateral meniscus and they go back to sport, it's, you know, it can be rapidly catastrophic. So this is the real question. What do you do for a young person they've lost their meniscus and they're to beginning to develop First signs, symptoms and signs of early degeneration in their knee. Um, some people would say an osteotomy. For me, if I've got somebody and I'm happy with their life <coughs> and, I, and they, they're developing problems because they've lost the meniscus, my first natural logical thought is well, put the new meniscus back in. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. It's, it's, we, you know, it's not black and white. There is, this is all open to discussion. But I, I think the, the 
in my view would be, and, and I share your view, that essentially it's about dealing with the abnormality. So if the abnormality is the patient has malalignment and they've lost a meniscus, then you should probably correct the malalignment as well as do I think you should definitely correct the malalignment. Yeah. And so then, if you've got an older patient, <coughs> and okay, define old, yeah. but if you're not that many years away from a knee replacement, then I think the osteotomy on its own no. is completely acceptable. I agree. Exactly. Much easier, much quicker yeah. rehab, um, much less to go wrong. Okay? If you're young and you've got good alignment, then I think a reconstruction is more appropriate. Yeah. And the real question, the real dilemma comes, well, what about the ones in the middle? You've exactly. got slight malalignment, like one or two degrees, but you're still young, you're like in your thirties. Then should you, do, should you do both, or should you only do one? And if so, which one? And if you're only going to do one, probably the answer is the osteotomy. I mean, putting, putting in a new meniscus in a man aligned knee is not a sensible option. Mm -hmm. Yeah, could you modify that question slightly and take away early generation and just have the symptomatic knee? Yes. Post meniscectomy. So yeah, that'd be more. Post in joint services. Yeah. Symptoms, they've lost the meniscus. Yeah. For me, that would be the perfect patient. I think they're dead right. So, this is Milikovsky, right? Um, he, he kind of changed the face of soft tissue knee surgery. Absolutely awesome. So, the number of patients say, is, oh, this is new because they've never heard of it before, they didn't realise it was available, they go, is it new? You're like, no, 1989, right? So he was doing them before, if he reported it in 89, he started doing it well before then. So this is one of the studies with Andrew Amos that we did at Imperial, and it simply shows left, left 2D, right, same data, but 3D. Lateral compartment, top, lateral meniscus intact, middle, no lateral meniscus, bottom with an anagraft, really important. It restores the contact pressures back towards normal, not to normal, <coughs> okay? Um, meniscal transplantation is a salvage procedure, not restorative, okay? Really, really important things like drum into the patient. Does it work? You only need to quote, you just need to read one paper. This is a really, really important paper. And they're saying that um, survivorship from the Donald's original series of meniscal transplants, which was about 100 patients or something like that, is 25%, 75% failure. Yeah. Right? right? Now, if you see that glass half full, half empty, mm -hmm. if I'm doing a meniscal transplant in a 30 year old, unless I'm doing it in something <coughs> 40, and I buy them 10 years, and now they're 50, and now they have their knee replacement. Okay, that's not the, 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 the tremendously wonderful outcome, but it's acceptable. Is that a failure? Okay. Do we think that meniscal transplantation is giving somebody a normal knee that will last them the rest of their life? Absolutely not, totally not. So is it glass 25%, sorry, 75% empty, 25% full? And also, you've got to go back and you've got to look at the Dom's original technique was to suture the meniscus in with no bone tunnels, certainly didn't use bone blocks, non-size match, fresh uh, anagraphs stitched into the knee with no fixation to the plateau. Okay? And yet still 25% of them were good at 20 year follow-up. I'd say that's fantastic results. <coughs> right, so you've got to be very, very careful about headline, headline stories. You've got to be really careful. So here's a knee, right? This is when I first started getting into municipal transplantation, um, inspired by Andrew Avis. Lateral compartment, detached the lateral epicondyle just to get access, took the meniscus out, drilled a tunnel from front to back, okay, took the top off so you've got a slot, got an anagraft, chopped it up, kept it on the bone block. Um, a little cora gives you a little cylinder bone with the lateral meniscus attached, slot it in, fix it in place, then peripheral sutures, and then stick your lateral clamping ligament back on, and then test it. Okay? The reality is, <coughs> doing meniscal transplantation with bone blocks is, is really very invasive and really technically very difficult, indeed. And the compromise, just stitching it in like the dog, like René the dog used to previously, <coughs> I don't think that's a, a program, I don't think that's, that's enough, but I don't think anybody would sensibly do that nowadays. <coughs> the compromise is Kevin Stone's technique, 
and, um, and that's to do transtibial tunnels. So, and then have your stay sutures <coughs> and your social ligaments pulling down into those transtibial tunnels, right? And tiny stay sutures across the anterior tibial cortex, and that's the, that's what I do now. We're, we're changing, we're evolving the techniques constantly. And those, those of us who are doing it in reasonably high numbers um, are doing different, a different operation now from what we were doing five years ago. And it will be different again in another five years' time. We're constantly, constantly trying to tweak it, trying to make it better. One of the other main reasons why I think that the Kevin Stone technique is far more appropriate. Much more forgiving, isn't it? Yeah. If you, if you look at your sizing protocols, most people use Pollard's technique or a modification of, and it's based on X-rays with size markers. Okay, you can use CT, you can use MRI. And I've published on this and looked at it in detail, and it doesn't matter what protocol you use, you're only going to be accurate in your guesstimate that the graph that you're going to have matches your knee. Okay? If you're lucky, it's going to be within, if your protocol is really, really good, and, and then most people would agree, that if, if you're within 5% and average, on average, you're within 5% of what's real from your sizing protocol, you'd be happy. Okay, it's never going to be 100%. 5% is good. Well, hold on, stop. The peripheral circumference of the meniscus is roughly 10 centimeters, or just roughly. 5% okay. error on 10 centimeters is 5 millimeters. Very clear biomechanical data that shows that if you move the insertional ligament by as little as 5 millimeters, you significantly change contact pressures. And so five millimeters out and you've kind of got less of a significantly less function. So if you say that your sizing protocol gives you an allograph that is on average within five, five millimeters of what's correct, then it's not the average you, know, you want to worry about. The average might not be good enough, but certainly there'll be a range and the range will be much bigger than the average. Okay, so you can be Let's say you're 95% confident that your graft will be within 10% of the real size that you need. Well, hold on. That means that 1 in 20 times is going to be more wrong than 10%. So what happens if you're doing your 20th <coughs> graft and it turns up and it's 15% now, which is perfectly, perfectly feasible. That's 1.5 centimeters too short. So what happens if you fix it in with a bone block, let's say you use the solid bone block, then that's absolutely fine. It's going to be a nice, you know, it's going to be in place, but it's not going to touch the periphery. You're not going to be able to stitch it around the periphery. It won't reach. Or if you fix your bone block at the back, just a bone plug, let's say, right, and you come around to the front, you're not going to get around to the, towards, towards the, you know, and the, near the ACL footprint. You're not going to get back to where the proper anatomical insertion is. You can be sticking it around on the anterior cortex somewhere. So sizing, size matters. And the problem is, when you're using bone blocks, you've, you're relying 100% on the appropriateness of your sizing protocol, and you're relying on luck as to that particular graph matching your particular knee. If you use the soft tissue technique, or well, sorry, the trans-osseous suture technique, <coughs> then actually you've got some leeway. But the way I do it is I get my posterior tunnel in, put my graft in, I put a little clip to keep the posterior stay, stay suture tensioned, then I lay the meniscus in the knee, <coughs> look at where the anterior surgical ligament is going to sit, make sure I'm pretty happy with that, then I'll put a few stitches in it. If I end up cutting those stitches out, I'm not that fast. Right? So I consider them as stay sutures, but if they're good, I'll leave them. Okay? And this is all inside. And then what I'll do is I'll, with an ACL guide, I'll look at exactly where that allograft wants to sit and exactly where my anterior tunnel wants to sit, and then I'll do my anterior tunnel. <coughs> and then what I'll do is I'll get my anterior and posterior stay sutures and I tie them across a little metal suture button. How tight do you tighten those stay sutures? As tight as you physically can. I haven't yet, and I'm paranoid about this, I haven't yet had a stay suture cut through a meniscus. But that's because I use fiber, fiber loop, and what I actually do. Is I actually capture the whole insertion ligament uh, with the whole fiber loop. I'll, I'll show you a picture. So, how hard do I put it? As hard as I physically can. Then I tie a load of knots on my suture button. Is there any slippage there? I guarantee there will be some slippage. There definitely will be some creep. So, is that a concern? Yeah. But it means I can adapt what I'm doing.
to the knee when I'm in there. I've got leeway. But I'm not saying that's right, I'm saying that's how I do it. And there are plenty of ways to skin a cat. Right, this is a guy in his early 40s who was referred to me. He's had um, a lateral meniscectomy by a colleague who's a great knee surgeon. Um, he doesn't do municipal transplantation. And the guy's got some patchy, roughening, a bit of filling of his articular cartilage in his lateral compartment, just a little bit rough. He's lost a whole of his lateral meniscus and he's got an unstable knee. So um, that's his, that's looking at his notch from his uh, medial thing, portal. So again, I'm going to do my tunnels, <coughs> get my, my um, ACL tunnels right, got my allograft. There's my five loops, five loops at the front, five loops at the back, and I do double. So I've got, I'm so, you know, so paranoid about it potentially ripping out, that I've got two, number two, five loop sutures. Um, in the anterior insertion ligament and two in the posterior insertion ligament. Okay. Put it into the knee, fix it in place, so just hold it in place under tension. Put a load of stitches in, there's my ACL graft in place, and there's my meniscus after I've actually glued it in as well. I'll show you this afternoon about the glue that I used. Now, one year later, you know I said I use a metal suture button and I put loads of stitches on as hard as I possibly can. Well, actually, that creates a little lump on the, ant on the ant anterolateral or anteromedial tibial cortex. Okay. And this guy was saying, this lump is irritating. It's, it's, it, it, it rubs, it's tender, I don't like it. So I said, that's easy, we just take it out. But I wanted to look inside at the same time. And so, looked inside, his ACL graft is still there, thank goodness. And his lateral meniscal allograft is healed. And looked, cut the suture button and the, and the knot away, just just easy, little incision, like a centimetre and a half, done, cut it, take it out, look back inside, absolutely made no difference to the graft at all, which is what you'd expect. So after, after a year, the, the sutures, the transosseous sutures are irrelevant. So if you need to take the button away, you can. Okay. So that's easy, right, that's a straightforward case.